I love Baptism Sunday. Amen. I love that wonderful picture of the reality of death to the self, death to the flesh, and then a resurrection unto new life in Christ Jesus. And it, uh, whether I know the person well or not, uh, it, it, I can say probably 99% of the time it brings tears to my eyes at the, the joy of seeing someone redeemed and called into the kingdom of God. I, uh, I love Baptism Sunday. I'm also grateful for the freedom that we have to meet together, the freedom that we have to meet in public, and the freedom that we have to proclaim the gospel to our community. And I'm grateful for that, uh, for that today and for many other things. Well, we continue our series through 2 Timothy. And if you've been following along and been with us past Sundays, uh, you'll know that Paul, beginning of this book, he has laid down the foundation of the gospel of who he is and who Timothy is and this, the gospel that they share and this wonderful um, heritage that they, that, they, that they share with their forefathers and, and, and their family members who've passed it on to them. And Paul outlines the need to suffer for this gospel because it's everything. And it's the only message that saves. And so having done this, he, last week we looked at uh, uh, the, the, the tip of, of what it means for suffering for the gospel, and that's the sovereignty of God is going to bring all those uh, whom God has chosen and whom God has taken and, and called his own, he will bring them uh, through suffering into his presence eventually. Um, and having done that now, Paul turns to Timothy and he starts giving him instructions as to how to be an approved workman. How to be an approved gospel worker in the church, an approved leader in the church. He outlines uh, how to preach the word properly, how to refute false teachers, how to lead, um, and eventually how to end well, how to end his life uh, as a faithful worker uh, for the gospel. So we, 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 we almost kind of start a new, a new turn in the book here where Paul is now outlining what it's like to be an approved worker before God. The scary part about this is that there are very specific applications and implications for church leaders. Paul's talking to Timothy after all, and Timothy is a church leader. And so, the scary part is, is that this is all the more, although all of Scripture is pertinent to us, this is all the more pertinent to those who, who, who want to lead in the church. But what is specific here for, possible, for church leaders is generally for all of God's people. So, um, we are all called to be faithful witnesses to the gospel. We're all called to be faithful soldiers, athletes, farmers in God's, uh, in God's workforce, God's area of work here. And so, um, what may be specific for church leaders is general for all of God's people. And therefore, we need to listen carefully and perk up because we all want to be found approved before God when we stand before Him. So, before we do that, and before we read, the, uh, move on to this passage of Scripture, let's pray. Gracious God, who, whose glory alone we seek, and whose glory alone we long for, you are the reason why we're here this morning. You've called us out of darkness, out of sin, given us new life in Christ Jesus, and we are eternally grateful for that. And meeting here this morning is an expression of our worship to you. You are our focus, you are our desire, and you are our hope. And as a congregation right now, we pray, and you know, some days we pray together as a congregation and our prayers are, are sorrowful and full of tears. And, uh, but today we have much to be hopeful and grateful for, including the, 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 the birth of Grace Elizabeth. Thank you so much for that. We're thankful for the, for the freedom that we have to meet here. We're thankful for, for, the, for baptism that we just, we just witnessed. Uh, and this brings us great joy. And uh, I, I pray that you would... Uh, you would continue this joy in us, continue to build up this joy that, uh, that we have for you and, and help us to be faithful followers. 
Help me now to be clear with the preaching of this, of this, of, uh, of this sermon. Help me to clearly portray the gospel um, and help me to forget the things I may have thought of and learned that, uh, uh, that, that are not in line with Scripture, but help me to recall the things that are in line with Scripture. And, and, and finally, I, I especially pray for our missionaries this morning who are all uh, over the world. Um, let's, we just remember them, and we ask that you would, would, would bless them, would give them hope, would give them peace, would give them, would, you would have your hand on them as they are, they are conducting gospel work in other countries uh, as we are here. Pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, quite a few years back uh, when I was living in Ottawa, one of the local radio stations did a, uh, a pretty funny, I think, April Fool's joke. And what they did was they, uh, they throughout their morning broadcast, they kept having... They kept bringing up the conversation to something to to a uh, a compound called dihydrogen monoxide. Wait, is that it? Dihydrogen monoxide, and uh, they brought in they, they they had experts call in to uh, to talk about this, and they had great concerns about this compound. And dihydrogen monoxide is is potentially dangerous. Uh, it uh, especially if it gets in the wrong part. If you if you ingest it, it can cause uh, asphyxiation and overexposure to dihydrogen monoxide can actually cause death. An added scary thing about dihydrogen monoxide is that it seems to be everywhere. It's in our homes, it's here in the church, and even more so in high levels, it's in our children's drinking fountains in the schools. And so it was, people were calling in, demanding that government workers do something, and they were People were calling in hysterical about this, this compound, dihydrogen monoxide, uh, and then they revealed at the end of their morning broadcast that dihydrogen monoxide is just another word for H2O, water. But, and and people, were, people were, were, were convinced that this compound was going to be the, the death of us all. And in reality, it's just, it's H2O. It's, it's water. Now that... The funny thing about that is that what they were saying was, there, it was, it was based in truth. Sure, overexposure to water can be fatal. And it is everywhere. And it certainly is in high levels in our children's drinking fountains in the schools. <laughs> but what made this joke so effective is that they were able to take something that is actually good for us. It's life-giving. We need this. And they were able to convince people that it was the worst thing on the planet, that it was going to be the death of them. And people were fooled and led astray. And I'm glad that eventually, it was, I hope they kept listening to the end of the broadcast, I'll just tell you that. But they were led astray. And, and, and they, they, they were led to believe that something good for them was actually harmful. And the point is this, is that the same thing happens today and indeed in Timothy's and Paul's time, with the gospel. It is a life-giving message to the world. And it needs to be proclaimed clearly and simply. Because then, as now, people take the gospel message and change it. And they lead people astray to their own destruction and their own ruin. We need gospel clarity today in the church. We live in an age of conflicting voices, and we need the clear and simple preaching of the true gospel that changes lives. Uncomplicated. Not taking words and making them mean something that they don't mean, or twisting things, but clear preaching of the gospel. And I would probably go so far as to say we, we need it all the more today. It seems like Anybody with an internet connection has a platform to speak. And certainly, it's been good for the, for the, for the, for the spread of the gospel. Uh, and so there are good aspects of that, but it just makes voices all that much more confusing when now anybody can stand on a platform and twist the gospel to mean something that it does not mean. We need gospel clarity in our age. Because we live in an age of conflicting voices. 
And so I want to convince you this morning, and I think this passage is telling us is this. The true gospel, it's simple, and it is clear, and it alone is life-changing. The true gospel is simple, and it is clear, but it, and it alone is life-changing. Now, don't get me wrong. God is, 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 a, is a... We will never fully understand God. I'm not saying He's easy, and I'm not saying that, he's, that He is simple. I am saying that He wants to reveal Himself. He has revealed Himself in the pages of Scripture, and He's given the message of hope to the world, to the church, to give to the world, and that message is clear, and it is simple, and that message alone is life-giving. And so we need to understand that and be faithful stewards of preaching the clear, simple, and life-giving gospel. So we start our passage in verse 14, and it seems like we're jumping in the middle of a thought, and kind of, indeed we are. Paul says in verse 14, keep reminding them of these things. Okay, so what are them and what are these things? Well, I would, I would quickly say that them probably rever- refers to those in, back in verse 2 uh, who are the faithful witnesses or reliable men who want to be qualified to teach in the church. That's why I think he's, he's, he's talking to those who lead in the church. But I think generally speaking, it's, it's the people of God. We all need to be faithful witnesses to the gospel. So, so Paul says, keep reminding them, yes, leaders, but also the entire church of these things. And what are these things? Well, it's what he just talked about. What we talked about maybe a month back. It's, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that our Lord is not dead, but he's alive. That Christ lived as, a, he, as, a, as fully God and fully human on this earth, a perfect and sinless life, that he died on a cross, that he was raised to life three days later, and that he's at the right hand of God in glory, and he reigns forever and ever and ever. And those who trust in him will be raised together with Christ at the end, and we will reign with him for eternity in glory in the presence of our God. We need to be reminded of the gospel. I'm grateful today was Baptism Sunday because we are reminded of the gospel Uh, in a very acute way in baptism. That we die to sin and we are raised again to life in Christ Jesus. This is the gospel. And we need to be reminded of it day after day after day after day. But then he seems to take a turn in the second part of verse 14. And he says, Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Uh, first thought, I, I thought, is this some kind of gossiping that he's warning against? Uh, is this some kind of nitpicky uh, definition of small words that are kind of meaningless? Is, what is this quarreling about words that, 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 that Paul means? And I think what Paul is getting at here when he says, don't quarrel about these words. Well, I'll tell you, it can't be gossip or something like that because a few verses later, we are told the word that is being quarreled over. And that's the word resurrection. This is not a nitpicky kind of word that we can have possibly different definitions. This is striking at the core of the gospel. If you change the definition of the word resurrection, you're changing the gospel. So whatever this is, is not just simple gossip, if I may call it that. It has its... There's something to be said about gossip, and that's another sermon. But this is striking at the heart of the gospel. And I think the point we can take from this is that how we were reminded of the gospel matters. Words matter. When we talk about the gospel, when we're reminded about the gospel, words definitely matter. Um, May I just say, I'm I'm amazed at what passes as the gospel these days. I'm amazed when people say, what's the gospel? Well, the gospel is God loves you. Well, sure, but that's not the complete gospel. Or the gospel is, you know, love God, love each other. Well, sure, it's based in truth, but it's not the complete gospel. The gospel is the, gospel is the kingdom of God here on earth and, in, and, 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 and something like that. Well, sure, but depending on what you mean by that, it may or may not be the gospel. 
it, it, it saddens me and, and strikes me that you could go to many different churches and talk to many different people and pastors, uh, and when I say gospel and when they say gospel, it may mean totally two totally different things. And so when Paul says here, don't quarrel about words, I think what he's saying is how you are reminding them about the gospel matters. The words you use and the definition of those words matters. Because if you have gospel muddying of the waters, if you have somebody who is intentionally twisting words and using vague words, what's the outcome? Well, the outcome is the latter part of verse 14. It's of no value. In other words, it's good for nothing, and it ruins those who listen. I've heard too many celebrity pastors on radio stations and talk shows or whatever uh, who when asked specific questions about the gospel or sin and redemption, they can't give a straight answer to save their lives. And it's some kind of wishy-washy answer that takes five minutes to explain, and, and at the end it says nothing. At the very least, those who are watching are, 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 are confused, but at the very worst, they're led astray because that's what they think the gospel is. No, no, words matter. The gospel, the true gospel, it is clear, it is simple, and it alone is life-giving. We're going to get to that in a second. So words matter, and how we explain the gospel is of utmost importance. And then in 15, Paul, Paul tells Timothy this, basically. So you want to be a preacher of the gospel. You want to be a workman, a gospel worker. How does one gospel worker, how do gospel workers avoid the temptation or the error or the sin of changing the gospel? And I think that he doesn't let us guess. He gives us, he gives us the answer in verse 15. Paul says to Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Okay, so this is what it means to be approved before God. You want to be a worker in the church? You want to preach the gospel? You want to share the gospel with your friends? Do your best to be approved, and this is what it means. A workman or work person who does not need to be ashamed and correctly handles the word of truth. For one thing, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for those who are being, who, those who are being saved. I got to make sure I get that quote right it's from the beginning of Romans. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. I'm sure in Timothy's age, with, with guards almost knocking at the door, there would have been the temptation to be ashamed and to change it. And in our day and age, the temptation to change it, to, to, to get out of ridicule or, or that kind of thing is real. But I'm telling you, don't be ashamed of the gospel. It is the only message that saves. It is the power of God to save those who, who He wants to save. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Proclaim it simple. Proclaim it clearly. Because the gospel alone, the clear, simple gospel and true gospel, saves lives. And may I add, the one who's not ashamed before man has nothing to be ashamed of before God. If you stand up, and I stand up to our society and our culture with the true gospel unashamedly, we will stand before God unashamedly. And oh, I want more than all for my, my Father in heaven and my, my God to be pleased with me and my work here uh, at FBC and in the world proclaiming the gospel. So you want to be an approved worker for the gospel? Don't be ashamed of it. Present yourself before God approved and unashamed and correctly handle the word of truth. Now, the word of truth here is the stuff that Paul has passed on to Timothy. Uh, probably, well, at the very least, it means whatever Paul has been telling Timothy up until now. Mainly, whatever, everything we've read in, in chapters 1 and chapter 2, handle this correctly. Know the truth that I've passed on to you. Study it. Love it. Read it often, listen to it often, and handle it, interpret it as it should be. Now, it, it, it's, 
tiny bit different from us today because we don't have the Apostle Paul as our mentor. But what we do have is the ultimate word of truth, which are the Scriptures. Timothy would have had the Old Testament, of course, but, but we have the word of truth here. And if we want to be unashamed and approved before God in our gospel witness, we must handle this correctly and interpret it correctly. There are many ways that we need to Many things we need to take into account for this. One, of course, is that we, we meet together as we do and we, and we talk about it and learn from each other and hear the preaching of the Word. Uh, but may I just simply say, and I, I, I say this out of love, okay? I, 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 just, I, I say this out of love. If you never pick up your Bible, you will not be handling it properly. You'll never handle the word of truth properly if you never pick up your Bible. I would go so far as to say, if you dust it off once a week for Sunday, you're not going to learn how to handle the word of truth properly. And that means when opposition comes and confusion comes and people come with a false gospel, how are you supposed to know how to refute it? How are you supposed to know what the true gospel is? And I say this out of love, because as we're going to see those who are led astray, the danger is their faith is ruined. And out of love, I want to tell you, I don't want you to be part of that faith of some who's ruined. So don't be ashamed of the gospel. And handle the word of truth properly. Read it often. Love it. Ask God before you read it, God, help me to love this. Help me to see this as, as, as help me to just enjoy this. Help me to, to eat this as a, as a sugary dessert. Let me find the joy in meeting with you and reading the scriptures. And God will, God will answer that. Oh, he'll answer that. He will give you joy and understanding when you come to him and read his word. And you will learn in the context of the church to handle God's truth properly and faithfully. And Lord willing, we will be a work people approved before God. So we want to be, you want to be workmen approved before God? Don't be ashamed of the gospel and handle His word, His truth properly. Because we will, through it, we will learn the simple and true gospel that changes lives. And the better you know it, the easier and simple, more simply it is to communicate to somebody. Because the true gospel is clear and it's simple and it alone is life-giving. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word, word of truth. But what's the alternative? What happens when you don't do this? What happens when someone, someone is ashamed of the gospel or they don't handle the word of truth correctly? And I think the alternative to this is what happens in verse 16. When Paul says, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. The alternative is, is simply godless chatter. It's, it's, it's taking... I, uh, I sat down with somebody and I... I you don't know who it is, but I sat down with somebody a while ago and I asked him, what is the gospel? And it was, a, it was a, this person should know what the gospel is. And it took 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, talking about stuff that at the end I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's godless chatter. It's godless chatter. It doesn't mean anything. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Sure, yes, godless chatter, it's progressive, but the only progress that it makes is towards ungodliness. And the more and more that it's indulged in, it just leads to ungodliness. It does not change lives like the true gospel does. And so the alternative of not being ashamed and handling the gospel truthfully is simply godless chatter. It's being so vague with terms that people are confused and walk away and they don't know what the gospel is. And Paul, Paul gives two real-life examples about people who've done this. 
So avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. And then in verse 17, their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. And what has happened to these guys? Verse 18 tells us they've wandered away from the truth. These people, whether they were ashamed or did not handle the word of truth properly, they engaged in godless chatter. And they've wandered away from the truth. And likely this is the same Hymenius or Hymenius, however you want to pronounce his name, that, t- that Paul talks about in 1 Timothy when he says, Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenius and Alexander. And, and then Paul says, Whom I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. What harsh words does Paul have for those who engage in godless chatter to lead people astray? This should tell us of the importance of being clear and simple with our gospel message. Lest we be led astray, lest we shipwreck our faith, and we wander from the truth and become like like these two. So here's two real-life examples of people who've done this, Hymenaeus and Philetus. (coughs) Their progress only leads to godliness, and in the end, they ruin their faith. Well, what's the teaching? The teaching is, uh, it's in verse, verse 18. They've wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Specifically, the words that are being quarreled about here is the word resurrection. What are they saying about it, the resurrection? Paul doesn't specifically tell us. It could very well be that, uh, by the way, they don't deny the resurrection. Right? This is tricky. This is the tricky part of not being clear with the gospel. They don't deny the resurrection. They're just twisting it. They're just changing it a little bit so that it means something else. Take baptism, for example. Uh, Baptism is is a... we, We see that as a person goes underwater, it is a picture of the death to the self and the death to sin. And as they come up out of the water, it's a picture of resurrection. They have a new life in Christ Jesus. Now, that's true. But that's not just the resurrection we're talking about here. It may be that they are simply saying, oh, well, yes, Christians, there's a spiritual resurrection, yes. Uh, But a physical resurrection, uh, no. But there's, there's a resurrection. It's just a spiritual resurrection. I don't know what they're teaching, but what is clear is that they are denying a physical resurrection bodily resurrection. And this is not just some little thing. This is striking at the heart of the gospel. Yes, we have death to the self and resurrection to new life in Christ Jesus where our desires change and we want to follow Christ, but that's not the the end of it because the hope, the final hope that we have is that one day after we die on this earth, we will have a bodily resurrection. All those who trust in Christ Jesus will not stay dead, but will be raised to life again and reign with Christ forever and ever and ever and ever. And to deny that is anti-gospel. To deny that is to walk away from the truth. And to deny that is to, is to shipwreck your faith. So what I think what's happening here is they're taking the clear meaning of, the, of a word like resurrection and they're twisting it to mean something that it's not. And Paul says, no, 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 no. I've I've handed them over to Satan to teach them not to blaspheme. Because Christ has indeed been raised from the dead physically, and those who trust in him will also, like him, be raised from the dead physically to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in his presence. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Deny that, and you shipwreck your faith. The true gospel is clear, and it is simple. And clearly, it alone is life-giving. And that's their teaching. They changed this term, resurrection. And what's the result of their teaching? Their teaching will, will, verse 17, go back to verse 17 for me. Their teaching will what? Spread like gangrene. So when I'm, when I'm looking at this word, I'm like, I wonder what this word is in, 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 in the original language. And the word's Gangrene. I guess this is where we get our word gangrene. So, 
I hope this is not a little bit too gross for some people, but what gangrene is, it is a cutoff of the blood supply to a certain part of the body, uh, usually fingers or toes or something like that. And when you cut off the life-giving blood supply, uh, they rot and die. And then it spreads to other tissues. I don't think we need to use our imaginations too much to see what Paul is getting at here. Just like in a body, if you cut off the blood supply, that life-giving blood supply, whatever part it's cut off to dies eventually. So if you cut off the true gospel, if people are being uh, led astray, if there are churches or if there are pastors who are, who are strangling their churches by not giving them the gospel, then they'll die. They will slowly rot and they'll die out. And it'll spread to the rest of the hearers. This is not something to just to, to, to wink an eye at. Is that the phrase? Whatever. This is life or death. This is striking at the heart of the gospel. Changing the gospel. Making it something that it's not supposed to be or, 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 or confusing it or making it confusing leads to death and it spreads. And the ultimate or eventually what it leads to, the extent of their teaching is that it's at the end of verse 18. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Let me be clear about the reality of these false teachers. And we see false teachers in our day too. The reality of false teachers is that they are heading to destruction and God's wrath. And they're taking people with them. They're surrounding themselves with people who are listening to them and their words may sound flowery and great, but the reality is, is they are headed down the path to God's wrath and hell and they're taking people with them. This is not a light matter. When you reject the true, simple teaching of the gospel. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Before I move on to the glorious part of verse 19, I think it's appropriate to talk about some implications. Uh, I'll put myself in there first. The first implication, I think, are for leaders in the church. If you are a leader in the church or you aspire to be the leader of the church, clarity in the gospel is of utmost importance. Say what you mean Say it clearly and don't let anybody walk out of the building confused with what you mean. That's my job on a Sunday morning and on Wednesday with the youth and Sunday school. That's Mike's job every single Sunday that nobody walks out of this building confused as to what the gospel is. That all of us are sinners before God. That all of us have spat in God's face and we hate God. That is our default position. And as such, we're in big trouble. That the wrath of God is on every single one of us, and eventually, that means hell. Could I be any clearer? That means hell. And it's every single one of us, and there's nothing that you and I can do about it. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that he took that punishment for you. That Christ came to earth to live a perfect life, so he had no sin in him. That he took the punishment that you and I deserve when he was on that cross. And the bloody, mangled body of our Lord and Savior is what you and I deserve. We rightfully deserve it because God is just. But because Jesus took it, he offers you forgiveness. He offers it freely to you. That if you believe that what he did was enough to pay for all of your sins... You're forgiven just like that. You stand justified before God just like that. That if you walk out of this building and you get hit by a bus, you will stand before God and God will look at you and he'll ask you one question. Did you trust in Jesus? And if you trusted in Jesus, he says, welcome into my presence, my glorious presence, where you will never experience sin ever and ever and ever again, but will be fully satisfied and fully joyful in my presence. But if you have rejected Jesus in this life, God will reject you and you will spend eternity in punishment. That's the gospel. We are all sinners 
And we were all on our way to hell. But Christ has come to, to, to step in the gap for us, to pay the price that we deserve. And if we believe in him and it's a free gift, we receive forgiveness. And then we have the hope of eternal life. That's my job every single time I get up here is to remind you of that clear and simple. And that's Mike's job every, morning, every Sunday morning too. So pray for us. Because it's not an easy task. It is a glorious task, but it's not an easy task. Pray for us and pray for the leaders of the church. And I think another implication here is that, you know what? The gospel, may I say it like this? The gospel is not a conversation, okay? The gospel is not, and I've heard too many people say, well, you know, um, you know everyone's got to live according to their own convictions, and, and God is the judge, and and, and it's just, we'll, we'll sit down and I want to hear your story and we'll, we'll figure out, we'll talk about what the gospel is for you and, 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 and let's look at the God moments in your life and see what he's doing. And, and that's all hogwash, okay? There, I mean, yes, conversation and lovingly building relationships with people is a good thing. We need that. But the, converse, the, the gospel is not a give and take. The gospel is a message that needs to be preached, the gospel is this. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes or no? Yes, you have eternal life. No, it's not going to change for you. Too bad. I'm not going to change the gospel because you don't like it. The gospel must be preached because only the gospel, clear and simple, is life-giving. It does nobody any good to change it. it. does nobody any good to muddy it, to confuse it. The gospel is clear and simple and must be preached to people. I'm all for being tolerant. I'm all for understanding where people come from. And yes, if you got questions, you need further explanation, you got my full attention. I'll say it to you again and I will explain it to you again. Yes, but you want to change it? You want me to change it? Too bad. It's not going to change. I'm all for loving people, and, 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 but I'm all for loving people the way God wants us to love people, which is to give them the gospel because without it, they're dead. Without it, they're on the way to hell. So I think those are implications here for church leaders. Be clear with the gospel and preach it. Don't, be, don't muddy it and say it's more, well, let's have a conversation about what give and take, what parts kind of are good, what parts are, you know, they're kind of hard to swallow. No, 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 no. The gospel is clear and it's simple. Christ died for you. Believe in him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized and you will have eternal life. But the implications here are not only for the leaders of the church, like I said, it's for all of us. One, every time you have a conversation with your friends and your family about the gospel, don't muddy it up. Don't muddy it up. Out of shame or, or, or whatever, don't muddy it up. Give it to them clear. Give it to them straight. We're all sinners before the God, myself included. But Christ has, God has made a way in Christ for us to, to be forgiven from our sins. Believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. Yes, develop friendships. Yes, but don't leave any confusion when you talk to your friends and family members about the gospel. And two, we need to be proper listeners. Because he did say, Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Uh, let me go back. I'm sorry. Um, quarreling about words of no value. It, what? It ruins those who listen. And they will become, uh, and back in verse uh, 18. Who have wandered away from the truth, they say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Twice here, Paul warns about listening to confusing or false gospels. We need to know our gospel. We need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ like, like this so that we know what a false gospel is and we can reject it. Let us be good listeners as well as, as communicators of the gospel. I think those are the implications we get from these verses, both for church leaders um, and for all of us. Clarity is what we need. Clarity is the need of the day in the gospel. Listen, the, the clock is ticking for Christ's return. He's not, he's not going to delay much longer. 
The clock is ticking for the return of Christ and what our society needs more than anything and their lives depend on it is the clear proclamation of the gospel. Let's not confuse people. Let's not give half answers. Let's be clear as to what the gospel means because their souls depend on it. And God has given this message to the church, to you and me. We're the only, the church, and I'm talking the church throughout the world, we alone have this message of the gospel. Let's not mess it up and confuse it. Let's proclaim it clearly because our culture needs it. Our society needs it. Our, our Leamington needs it. North America needs clear gospel teaching. The clock is ticking. Let us be found faithful when, when the clock is up and Christ returns. But of course, as Paul usually does, um, he doesn't leave things on a, on a tough note. He's reminded of the glory of God's sovereignty and God's providence and God's love and provision for his people. And he goes on to verse 19. Yes, in light of all the false teachers that have risen up, and yes, in light of the fact that they exist still 2,000 years later today, and yes, in light of the fact that they are spreading a false gospel that's, that spreads like gangrene and destroys the faith of some, yes, in light of all this bad news, Verse 19 says, nevertheless, 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 God gets the final word, doesn't he? God always gets the final word. 19, nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, and I believe he means the church. God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are His. God knows. God knows His people. God knows those who are His. And the implication I think here is that God knows those who are His and He will keep them. He will sustain them. He will protect them. And He will lead them through this. Because because where this quote is taken is from from a a situation and story in the Old Testament where, where Korah... A guy named Korah was leading a rebellion against Moses. I'll give you the Coles notes. Leading a rebellion against Moses, and they're disputing his leadership. And God does what only God can do, and he separates the people from those who, who oppose Moses and the rest of the camp, and God opens up the ground and swallows those who are in rebellion. And those left are God's people. Yes, it was a sad thing that day that, that, that rebellion and, and, and we could call it heresy rose up and it was a sad thing that, that, that God's judgment was poured out. But he did not destroy the whole camp. He preserved his people because God knows those who are his and his hand is firmly holding his people and he will sustain us. So nevertheless, in light of all of this that's going on, God will sustain his people. Indeed, he will. And everyone who, confu- who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Because only the true gospel is simple, and it is clear, and it is life-giving. No false gospel produces righteous people. As, as flowery as it may be, and as good as it may as, as, as good as it may sound, and as 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 happy as these movements may look, no false gospel produces righteous people. No false gospel produces uh, um, God's people who have a change of identity, who who want to kill off the old sinful self and have new desires to live for Christ. No false gospel does that. No flowery, uh, yeah, no flowery false gospel does that. Only the clear, simple gospel of Jesus Christ does that. Only those who believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their, of their sins are new creations. And only those who are new creations uh, want to live for Jesus. Only those who are new creations want to live out the end of this passage, turning away from wickedness. Only those who truly name the name of Jesus desire to turn away from wickedness and to follow Jesus. I hope, you, I hope that you desire that. 
I hope, and yes, yes, we're all going to struggle with sin until the day we die. I'm, I'm convinced of that. But I, I hope that you desire, I hope that deep down inside, at the core of who you are, you hate your sin. I do. I hope you daydream. I daydream sometime about what it's going to be like when, when sin is completely out of, my, out of me. I daydream what it's going to be like when I do not struggle with sin ever again for all of eternity. I hope you do that. Do you do that? Do you long to be freed from sin and be like Jesus and be with Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever? If you do that, I think chances are pretty high that you are a son or daughter of God. God knows who you are and who his people is. And he causes his people to want to turn away from wickedness and to want to be satisfied in Jesus and with Jesus for all of eternity. That's what heaven is. Wickedness is defeated, evil is gone, and we are with Christ in perfect holiness with him, reigning with him, and being completely satisfied in the person of Jesus Christ. Man, what other message gives life like that? What other false gospel gives that promise? It is only the clear and simple gospel of Jesus Christ that is life-giving like that. And so in case I missed it before, let me just be, let me be clear again. We're all sinners before God. Let me remind you, as Paul tells Timothy to remind the people, let me remind you one more time of the gospel, why we're here and why we exist. Is that though we are all sinners... And bound for hell, God stepped in and sent Jesus Christ, his son, to live a perfect life. That dying on the cross, he takes the punishment that you and I deserve. That all of those, without exception, who believe in Jesus Christ are forgiven of all their sins and now have the hope of eternal life. And in the meantime, we struggle against sin and turn from wickedness and desire to be holy. Yes, in this day of, of, of conflicting voices and gospel confusion, it is of utmost importance that we be clear and simple with the gospel. For what else is life-giving but our gospel? It is my sincere hope that from our church, always, always, there will loudly ring the clear, simple, life-giving message of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for this reminder of, of, of that though you are ultimately, we will never fully know you, even into eternity. Um, you have revealed yourself to us, and you have revealed your plan to us of saving humanity. And you didn't complicate it. You made it simple so that any one of us, even even Dull people like, like myself can, can get it. God, I pray that that would be the heart of who we are here at First Baptist, that we would be people who don't complicate it, don't change it, don't muddy the waters, but we, we, we say what we mean and we, we define terms exactly how they're supposed to so that everyone who hears us talk about you knows exactly what they need to do to turn to Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. Thank you for our meeting this morning, and I thank you that, that new life in Christ Jesus is who we are, the center, it's the center and core of who we are as a people, and that's why we meet. I do pray that you be with us and you bless us this week as we go, and, and, and any opportunity we have to share the gospel, we would be faithful, approved, not ashamed, but correctly handling your life-giving, simple word of truth. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.